Hello, and welcome to Maine DOE's Office of Special Services Monitoring Teams Professional Development About Eligibility Forms. My name is Leora Byrus, um, and this is the Gen Federal General Supervision and Monitoring Team of OSSI for Maine. Um, Colette Sullivan is our Federal Programs Coordinator. Jennifer Gleason is a special education consultant. Julie Pelletier is our secretary associate. And with me today recording is Carly Thibodeau. Hi, I'm Carly Thibodeau. Um, I joined the team in July. And before that, I was a teacher for 21 years. Awesome, thank you. Here is our contact information. We do our best to get back to folks within about 24 hours. Um, but especially in certain times of the year, like the winter and, and early spring and springtime, we're doing site visits. So sometimes that timeline can be a little bit extended, but we absolutely love to have case managers, teachers, directors reach out to us with questions as they might arise as you're doing some of the required paperwork for special education, which we know is, is a lot um, in the special education world. So if questions come up um, as, you're, as you're working, please feel free to reach out to us and we will do our best to get back to you as soon as we can. So I have introduced both myself and Carly. We are gonna go through Muser's eligibility criteria Muser being the main unified special education regulations. We're going to go through each of the three eligibility forms that Maine uses to either determine initial eligibility or continuing eligibility on that three year required rotation for reevaluation. And we're going to talk about eligibility form compliance. So we're actually going to tell you exactly what we're looking for when we monitor eligibility forms during um, when a district is in their monitoring cohort. The procedural manual is a wonderful tool it is updated every time the, any required documentation for special education in Maine is updated. And it gives you basically a task analysis of how to fill out every part of every piece of required documentation. Um, it, it's a great resource and we really encourage you uh, if you're someone who is responsible for special education documentation to have this as a resource to be able to look back um, and, and use as, as questions come up as well. Everything that we do is based on MUSER, the main unified special education regulations, also called chapter 101 which is also based on IDEA. So today is March 8th of 2023, and MUSER is currently in rewrite right now. So it won't be changing until at least next legislative se uh, session because it's, it's being rewritten right now. When MUSER is adopt, accepted and adopted by the legislature, then we will update the procedural manual and we will re-record any professional development that um, we do related to any of the updates in MUSER. Okay, what is the purpose of an IEP? This is directly from IDEA, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. And what this says is that children who have disabilities have the same right to a free appropriate public education, FAPE, that every child who doesn't have a disability has as well. And that education, that specially designed instruction and the related services should be tailored to meet the needs of that child to help them develop into productive, um, independent, as independent as possible members of our, our 
society. And we always want to remember in the back of our heads that our special education students are general education students first. And we should always want them to participate and move back into the general education setting as much as they are able to with their general education peers. So this is section two of the IEP. You'll remember that section one um, is the, the demographic information and required dates and timelines. This section looks at all of the disability categories, including multiple disability. If the child has multiple disabilities, then you would check the, that box and you would check the boxes that make up the multiple designation for that particular student. So if it was a student who was um, who is identified with speech and language impairment and OHI, you would check off multiple speech language impairment and other health impairment. Otherwise, you just check off the one disability category that the child is found eligible under. So a child is a dis a child has a disability. Oh, let me rephrase that. A child with a disability is an individual who is at least three years old, has not graduated from high school or secondary prog uh, programs with a high school diploma or each the, rage, the age of 20. Maine sent out an administrative letter in January of 2021 to extend access to FAPE until age 22. That's not yet in statute because remember, MUSER is still in rewrite. However, it is an administrative letter that came out of a district court decision um, in Rhode Island. And because Maine is in the same circuit as Rhode Island, we realized that it wouldn't be long before Maine um, would need to legislate this change as well. So the administrative letter went out preemptively. Um, and don't forget that once a child graduates or has a diploma, access to FAPE ends. So we need to make sure that that child been, has been observed in the learning environment or their classroom setting and has been evaluated according to all of these MUSER regulations. There are specific requirements um, for different disabilities as the team, an IEP team, goes through um, the evaluation process. And we're actually going to go through those specifics in just a minute. Here is a link to the administrative letter that I was referring to that extends eligibility to FAPE to age 22. So we're going to start with the disability categories and we're going to go through all of them. You'll notice as we go through many of them that the procedures for determination start with data from the general education interventions using research-based intervention techniques. That is very, very important. We don't want to over-restrict a child or take them away from their general education peers to be educated unless we absolutely have to. We need to make sure that we're going through the process with fidelity to look at that least restrictive environment. As we go through these, what we're really looking for is an adverse effect. A child could have a disability or a diagnosis, for example, but it may not be to such a degree that it has an adverse effect on their ability to be educated. So it really goes back to the nature and severity of their disability and what they need for programming and related services to access their education. So for autism, you can see that we're looking for that adverse effect on educational performance. Um, there are some characteristics that are listed there that are common um, with people who may have uh, be 
in the disability category of autism, like repetitive activities and stereotype movements, resistance to environmental change or change in daily routines, or unusual responses to sensory experiences. But remember, autism is a spectrum, and we may or may not see um, one or more of those typical acti activities or behaviors. So the procedures for determination, we start out with that data from the general education interventions. And we wanna look at what accommodations were tried, what um, MTSS process or multi-tier system of support process or PBIS supports were used for that child um, as they went through that process. The other piece that you'll see often on some of these slides is that the person who is making the diagnostic impression under the DSM codes needs to be someone who is qualified to do so. Very often that would be a school psychologist. It could also be a speech pathologist in the case of a speech and language um, disability category. Deaf blindness is its own disability category even under IDEA. So deaf blindness is not considered a multiple disability. If the child has the disability of deaf blindness, you don't even have to fill out an eligibility form for them. Like that is what um, IDEA says. So this is a completely separate disability category. They should not be counted as multiply disabled. Um, and Part of the process of evaluating are audiological and medical evaluations. And those pieces would help the team determine eligibility. Deafness is a disability category that the team would also look at audiological and medical evaluations. Um, and the IEP team would want to ensure that there are experts at the, in the field that are at the table helping with the process of eligibility. So the assessments could be conducted by a teacher of the deaf or heart hearing impaired or a speech language pathologist or another person who is qualified to do so by the IEP team. Those are the folks that will help um, guide the IEP team through the eligibility category. Developmental delay disability category for Maine is aged three to five. There are states that go higher or allow a child to stay in this disability category for longer than Maine does. But Maine says that by the end of kindergarten, the child needs to have um, a different disability category than developmental delay. So there are five different areas that are looked at um, if the team is questioning developmental delay. They're, they are physical development, cognitive development, communication development, social or emotional development, or adaptive development. So the team would look at all five of those domains um, the individual who is evaluating the child needs to be qualified to do so and have formal training in professional standards of assessing young children. Because I'm sure you realize that those little three to five years old are, are going to be different to evaluate than some of the older kids, right? So the criteria for identifying significant delays are scores of at least 1.5 standard deviations below the mean in at least two of the five domains or two standard deviations below the mean in one of the five listed domains. Um, and this process should also include an observation of the child in the learning environment or in the environment that they are in that is appropriate for a child of that age. And that is to document their educational performance and behavior in the areas of difficulty. And that observation should be done by someone who's certified by in special education. And if at all possible, should be someone who is not the child's current provider who's doing that observation. 
And the team will look at all of that information, fill out the, the adverse effect on um, educational performance form, eligibility form, and use the evaluations to determine whether those whether that disability has an adverse effect on the child's ability to access their education. Emotional disturbance is a condition in where the person exhibits one or more of the following characteristics over a long period of time and to a marked degree that adversely affect their child's, the child's educational performance. So it could be an inability to learn that cannot be explained by intellectual, sensory, or health factors, an inability to build or maintain satisfactory interpersonal relationships with peers and teachers, inappropriate types of behaviors or feelings under normal circumstances, a general pervasive mood of unhappiness or depression, or a tendency to develop physical symptoms or fears associated with personal or school problems. So this is another disability category where the team would start from data from the general education intervention so that we're really looking at ensuring that the child had access in the general education curriculum to accommodations that may help them stay in that environment, um, to the multi-systems tiers of support um, so that that LRE process is being followed. And again, the evaluation for emotional disturbance should be done by someone who's qualified to do that under the DSM codes. And very often that would be a school psychologist. A hearing impairment is another disability category where an audiological and medical evaluation should be utilized as part of the multidisciplinary determination. So the team gathers that information and would fill out the adverse effect on educational performance eligibility form and see whether that hearing impairment is to such a degree that it has an adverse effect on the child's ability to be educated. Intellectual disability. This means significantly sub-average general intellectual functioning existing concurrently with deficits and adaptive behaviors and manifested during the developmental period that adversely affect the child's educational performance. So again, the evaluation should be done by a professional who's qualified to make those impressions under the current DSM codes. And again, that very often would be a school psychologist, although not always. Um, and then the IEP team would meet to determine whether the intellectual disability was to such a degree that it adversely affects the child's um, access to their education. Multiple disabilities. So multiple disabilities, Maine has an unusually high identification of multiple disabilities. We average about 8% higher than the national average for identifying multiple disabilities. And because of this, several years ago, I think it was 2018, um, OSEP, the Office of Special Education Programming, um, asked that Maine really look at how we were determining our multiple, our, our students who were determined to have multiple disabilities. We really want the team to think about, is there a primary disability? Then if the child, for example, um, if the child was identified with autism, for example, right? It's very common for a child who may have autism to have speech and language needs as well, right? Um, those social pragmatic pieces, um, those are very common uh, and manifest with people who have autism. So we would be surprised if we ran across an IEP where the child was multiple disabilities autism and speech and language, because very often those go hand in hand. So in that situation, the team might say that autism is the primary disability and those speech and language needs 
can be programmed for with related services because it wouldn't be a true multiple because the autism is sort of driving that bus. So that's what we're really asking IEP teams to do is when we when you come across students who you wonder, are they multiples or not, really think about and talk as a team, is there a primary disability and the other concerns can be addressed with related services as part of that disability? Or is it truly that the team cannot tell which of these disability categories is having the biggest adverse effect? So it's about those concomitant disabilities that they're both equally influencing that child's inability to access FAPE. So here is our um, information. This, um, this is the, those um, statistics that I was talking about, the data. So in 2021, the national percentage was 1.8% um, and Maine's percent in 2021 was 8.83, oops, pardon me, 10.77. Uh, so you can see that we are about 8% over that national average. Orthopedic impairment should include a referral with a diagnosis from a licensed physician as to the existence of the orthopedic impairment. And that orthopedic impairment could be the result of a congenital anomaly, a disease, or another condition. So the team would look at that um, orthopedic impairment and determine whether it is to such a degree that it's creating an adverse effect on the child's ability to be educated. So filling out that determination of adverse effect eligibility form and putting in the evaluative information would guide that conversation for the IEP team to see whether the child requires specially designed instruction. Other health impairment there are so many reasons that the team might look at other health impairment as a disability category. And you can see some of them are listed here, and this is not an exhaustive list. So it could be asthma, it could be diabetes, epilepsy, sickle cell anemia. Most often we see OHI due to attention deficit disorder or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder but that's not always the case. It could be lead poisoning, Tourette syndrome, et cetera. So there's a lot of different um, diagnoses that could lead to an other health impairment disability category. So you can see that this disability category starts with data from the general education intervention, right? Because again, we wanna follow that LRE. The IEP team should look at any written diagnoses, psychological and medical evaluations that are relevant to the identification process, keeping in mind, of course, that those should all be under current diagnostic criteria. And the child should also be observed across settings, including in the educational department. Um, in the educational environment if they are currently participating in an educational environment. And those observations should include um, a comparison of the, of the referred child's behavior to the same aged peer's behavior in the same environment. Further, if you're looking at OHI or ADD or ADHD, there are some extra steps that the team needs to take. There should be a psychosocial history done. There should be clinical interviews. Again, structured observations of the child's behavior in the educational setting. There should be behavior rating scales. Normally that's a BASC, but that's not always the case. But when we see OHI on an IEP and we turn to 4A, we're looking for behavior rating scales. And if we don't see them, the first thing that we'll ask the team is, is this OHI for ADD or ADHD? And if the answer is, yep, it's for ADD, then it could be, um, it could be a finding for a corrective action plan if that BASC, for instance, isn't in 4A, because it is a requirement um, based on users' um, requirements for determination for OHI. 
speech or language impairment, we really encourage you to rely on your speech and language pathologists if you are questioning speech or language impairment. They are the experts. They have the specialized training to do the evaluations and to guide the team through filling out the speech and language eligibility form. And that speech and language eligibility form has the adverse effect piece built into it. So you follow the steps of that form, make sure that you have data-driven evaluative information, um, and it will help you discern whether the child um, has that disability to such a degree that they need SDI in order to be educated. So just as we encourage you to rely on your speech and language pathologist for speech and language disability, we encourage you to rely on your school psychologist for specific learning disabilities because Again, this is a very specialized field, and school psychologists have that specialized training in order to um, help the team go through the pattern of strengths and weaknesses and performance, achievement, or both relative to age. And also, they have the specialized training to be able to discern the rule outs. So the rule outs are ensuring that the SLD is not due to a visual hearing or motor disability, an educational disability, um, an emotional disturbance, a cultural factor, an environmental or economic disadvantage factor, or limited English proficiency. So get your school psychologist to the table. And, and I say that knowing that we have um, we have wonderful school psychologists in Maine, but we don't have enough of them, especially in some parts of the state. We know that at a state level and have been talking about different ideas and, and um, initiatives that could, could assist with that. Um, so please do your best to get your school psychologist to the table um, and they can help with this process. Traumatic brain it, um, injury could be the result of either an open or closed head injury. Um, and there are so many different areas that a TBI could um, influence could be cognition, language, memory, attention, perceptual or motor abilities, psychosocial behavior, physical function, speech. There are so many different ways that a TBI could manifest itself. So this is another disability category where we really want to make sure that the folks who are determining eligibility are qualified to do that. And the team would go through their evaluations and see whether the impairment is to such a degree that it has an adverse effect on the child's educational performance. All right, and the last disability category we're gonna talk about is visual impairment, including blindness. So this is a disability category where you would want to have a licensed qualified optometrist or ophthalmologist at the table because they are able to do the evaluation and diagnostics that would um, tell the team whether the child has a visual impairment. And the team would use that evaluative information to fill out the determination of adverse effect and see whether that child needs specially designed instruction to access their education. So what does adverse effect really mean? It means that the child has a negative impact that is more than a minor or transient hindrance to their ability to be educated. So there's, there's impediments to their being able to be in the classroom and access the learning like their general education peers can. 
So determining eligibility, you would document the disability based on the initial or the reevaluation eligibility decision. Their main has three different eligibility forms, the speech or language impairment eligibility form, the specific learning disability eligibility form, or the for form for determination of adverse effect on educational performance. The team might have to use one or more of these forms depending on the disability categories that you're questioning. If, for example, you were questioning OHI in speech and language, you, the team would fill out both the speech or language impairment form and the form for determination of adverse effect on educational performance and make a decision about which of those um, disability categories best fits uh, that particular student. These forms are also used to dismiss students from special education services. So, these are the disability categories where you would go right to the form of the determination of adverse effect form on educational performance. Autism, deafness, developmental delay, emotional disturbance, hearing impairment, intellectual disability, oops, hold on, orthopedic impairment, other health impairment, traumatic brain injury, and visual impairment, including blindness. So you'll notice that speech or language impairment is crossed out. That's an error in user that has been taken into account during the rewrites. So you would not have to fill out the form for determination of adverse effect on educational performance for deaf blindness, because that's its own disability category, for multiple disabilities, because you would use whichever of the forms most fits the disability categories that you're looking for, or for specific learning disability, because that has its own form. So here's the table of contents for um, the procedural manual, and it tells you exactly where you find the information for determination of adverse effect, SLD, speech or language, and the written notice. So now we're going to go through each of the eligibility forms, and I'm going to preface this by saying that most of the next slides that you're going to see are directly snipped from the procedural manual because that's where we get our information and guidance. Excuse me, I need to get a little drink. Okay. So we're going to start with the adverse effect on educational performance form. This is the demographic information. You'll notice that it has our logo on it, which means that it's now a standalone form. You do not have to attach it to a written notice. There was a time in practice where that had to happen, no longer the case. Um, the reason for use of the form, people miss this for some reason, um, and it is a requirement. So the check boxes for initial eligibility or for continuing eligibility slash dismissal, just don't forget to check one of those off and, and when you're filling out the form. And this information is on page six of the procedural manual. So this form is used to provide a written record regarding the determination of adverse effect on educational performance. So this particular piece is talking about what an adverse effect is, which we talked about. Those It means a barrier to the child's ability to be educated like their general education peers. And on this form in particular, NA stands for not available. So again, this piece is on page six of the procedural manual as well. So the directions for the use of the form. So this would be used to determine eligibility for special education services, considering a change in eligibility or dismissal from special education services. Um, and then it also is, this slide is also um, telling us what disability categories would be used this form would be used to determine, um, which we already talked about. But if you need a reminder, it's on page six of the procedural manual. 
So section 1A of this form is used to document data considered and indicate whether it supports a determination of adverse effect is on page seven of the procedural manual. The verification should include data-driven evaluative information. We want to make sure that um, all the decisions that the IEP team is making are based on objective information. So some examples of data sources for the for um, category number one, if you were looking at the littles for three to five year olds, it could be a WIPSI, it could be the autism diagnostic observations schedule for grades K to 12. And that's not an exhaustive list, just to make sure everybody knows that. It's just some examples. Um, for K grades K to 12, it might include a Woodcock Johnson, or a WISC, or a gray oral reading test, for example. Again, not an exhaustive list. So the IEP team's determination of adverse effect is based on the results of the assessments, the data sources that the team is using to verify the effect of the disability on the child's educational performance. So we also encourage you to use multiple assessments and data sources to make that determination. So the second piece of the adverse effect on educational performance, um, some examples of data sources for this category could be the NUIA, could be a PSAT or an SAT. Again, not an exhaustive list. Um, category number three on the form could be um, the Adaptive Behavior Assessment System, second edition for those three to five-year-old little guys, or the CDS Eligibility Observation Summary. When we're talking about older kids, it could be the Vineland, it could be the Adaptive Behavior Assessment System scores, could be academic grades, reports by the parent or outside providers, reports of whether the child meets standards in a standard-based system, so these are some um, ideas for what the verifications could be. And just remember, don't leave anything blank on any of the eligibility forms. You wanna make sure that either yes, no, or NA is checked off on each of these questions. Um, for question number four, some examples of data sources for the little guys, it could be, Assessment, Evaluation, and Programming System for Infants and Children, second edition, um, or a child observation record. Um, and for K-12, to it could be MEAs or it, the main through-year assessment. That's the, the current assessment that we're using. NUIAs, writing prompts, curriculum-based measures such as a DRA, everyday math, Ames Web, et cetera. Um, or it could even be curriculum unit tests. And this is on page eight of the procedural manual. And don't forget, yes, no, or NA. So on number five, it could be the ABLES, the Brigants, um, the NUIAs, the MEAs, or the main through year assessment, classroom test scores. So that's the verifications that we're looking for is that um, data driven evaluative information. For question number six, you could look at writing prompts, handwriting samples, portfolios of work, or classroom work samples for verification. So this question specifically is, do child work products, language samples, or portfolios demonstrate adverse effect? So these would be some of um, examples of data sources that you could use to say whether or not there is that adverse effect for that verification piece. Um, number seven, some examples of data sources that you could use, um, disciplinary reports or office referrals, FBAs. This is the place where you want to put your FBA information, those vast grading scales that we were talking about earlier, a brief, um, information that you have from the classroom, like classroom observations or your behavior data sheets and logs. This is where that information would go um, to talk about the disciplinary evidence um, that might show that adverse effect piece. 
Um, question number eight is about attendance, right? Because remember, um, attendance can have an adverse effect, right, on the child's ability to be educated. So in this verification, you would put their attendance records, either their school program or their class attendance. Um, and if you would like some more information on this, it's on page nine of the procedural manual. And once again, don't forget, yes, no, or NA here. All right, question number nine is asking about social or emotional deficits, if any, right? Because remember, there's an NA category for a reason. You know, not every child is going to have a yes for every single one of these um, categories. Um, for verification, some examples that you could use for these data sources are a BASC, a Brief, an Achenbach, Connors Rating Scales, multi-dimensional anxiety scale for children, Piers Harris self-concept scale, autism rating scales, observation information, those would all be appropriate to use for verifications. Okay, and the last category is other. So any other evaluative information or classroom information or observation information that the team feels would be relevant to the decision of adverse effect, this is where you could put that. So then we go into section 1B, which is the single assessment question. Was only one assessment or data source considered? So if the answer to the question is yes, state the IEP team's rationale for the determination that the single assessment data source is adequate for the demonstration of adverse effect on educational performance. Because as you all know, as special educators, we like to have as much information as possible. We want to have, um, you know, evaluation after evaluation to back up what that first evaluation says. But there are some times where they might not be available for one reason or another. So in this box is where you might say why you're only using one piece of data to, to make that determination. Section two is used to indicate whether the IEP team has determined that there is an adverse effect or not. So this one doesn't have an NA because this is the big one. This is, has the team used this information to say, yes, the child has an adverse effect on their, on their education or no, they don't. So, Big things to go to remember as you complete the adverse effect form um, is just making sure that there aren't any blank boxes and that you have multiple data sources. Um, and you only have to complete section three of the form if section if the answer to section two is yes. So make sure to read those prompts on the forms closely because you don't want to do more work than you have to. So question number three is the adverse effect that results from the child disability is to such a degree that they require special education in order to benefit from their education program or correctable through accommodations in the child's reg regular education and program. And then you have a summary of that determination made by the IEP team. Um, and you would put that information in that box. If you need more information on what that might look like, page 11 of the procedural manual will help you out. And here is an excerpt of some more information about that, that the team would be explaining their decision in that section. Really, really, really important from a compliance standpoint, these eligibility forms should be filled out as much as possible at the IEP team meeting. It may be that, you know, given time restraints that the person filling out the form might put, you know, some of that evaluative information in the form prior to the meeting. But you would want to be careful about that to make sure that everyone involved in the decision making um, is, is part of those. Um, but given time restraints, it, it may be that the IEP team, um, that that would be helpful for the process. Make sure that 
the form is completed at the IEP team meeting and that in the written notice, there is a statement explicitly saying the team used the determination of adverse effect form and the child was found eligible under the disability category of other health impairment. Or you could say the team used the determination of adverse effect form and an adverse effect was not found, the child can be accommodated in the general education curriculum. But that statement, either way, needs to be in the written notice of that meeting. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the speech or language impairment eligibility form. So the top section is that demographic information of the child. Um, this is all the way in page 74 of the procedural manual because you probably used your context clues and noticed that the table of contents of the procedural manual is alphabetical. So we're dropping down a few all the way to the S's here. So there are four different domains that are looked at for the speech or language eligibility form, articulation, language, fluency and voice impairment. So each of those domains would be evaluated as part of the process. There are rating scales attached to the form and all four of those rating scales need to be attached in order for the form to be complete. So this section is used to specify an impairment based on the severity rating scales. So in order to answer the questions, the IEP team needs to complete the severity, the severity rating scales um, that, that are attached. And those severity rating scales determine the answers to the following questions. So on those severity rating scales, any scores of moderate or severe in any of the categories would um, the, the team would answer the corresponding question with a yes. Um, if the team recorded no apparent problem, mild in any of the categories, or checked no assessment needed, then the answer to the corresponding question would be no. And this is where you would complete the verification boxes for each of the four questions. You would record um, the scores on the formal assessments with a short narrative, um, to look at any informal assessments that the team might have used. You would look at the sources of data or information, and that could include standardized assessments, language samples, checklists, criterion referenced assessments, rating scales like the observational rating scale or pragmatics activities checklist from the self five. So the team would identify the component of the assessments that reveal the presence or the degree of the impairment. Um, and if the answer is no, because that particular domain was not assessed, um, then you would indicate not an area of suspected disability in the verification box for that particular domain. So um, this section, it's section five of the speech and language impairment form, asks whether a speech or language impairment exists. It's either a yes or no. So if the team is checked yes to any of the any of the questions in one through four that correspond with those rating scales, then you would uh, and check yes on question five, then go on to question six. If not, then you would check no on question five, and that would show that the child does not qualify as a child with speech or language impairment. So here is question six. Does the child's speech or language impairment adversely affect their educational performance? Because remember, it is possible that a child could have a mild articulation and it doesn't affect their ability to be educated. So they would just be in the general education curriculum. So um, that those evaluative information, those assessments are super important. Okay, so sources of data for the verification for question six could be um, classroom grades, child work products, measurements of attainment of literacy standards, scores on standardized tests, 
including reading comprehension scores, teacher and parent reports, evidence of functional communication skills, evidence of social cognitive strengths or in social pragmatics, records of attendance, disciplinary evidence or behavior rating scales and observations or ratings of social emotional functioning. Um, and then we get to question seven. If there is a speech or language impairment, the impairment is of such a nature and degree that, so that the team is gonna check one, either the child requires special education or that impairment can be adequately addressed through general education interventions and or accommodations. So this again talks about question six, those yes or no's. So the articulation severity scale, articulation impairments are abnormal production of speech sounds, including substitutions, omissions, distortions, or additions of speech sounds not commensurate with the child's chronological age or cultural linguistic background and not related to dialect. So the articulation rating scale is used to determine the articulation impairment. So um, this is giving us some information about that moderate or severe um, piece. And this is the very top piece of that articulation severity scale. So you can see up on the top left, if you're looking at language and you're not worried about articulation, you can just check the box for a no articulation assessment needed and just make sure to attach it to the form so the form is complete. So if the team goes through the process and there's no apparent problem or mild, then it would be indicative that the child does not have an adverse effect. If the team is looking at moderate or severe in the description of articulation or with the standardized assessments, informal assessments, and those are broken up into age brackets, then we, you would be looking at there being an adverse effect um, that speech, speech impairment having, pardon me, the articulation impairment is to such a degree that it has an adverse effect. So the language severity rating scale, um, language impairment is any deviation in form of language like phonology, morphology, and syntax the content of language, vocabulary, and semantics, and or the functional use of language, pragmatics, perceived to be outside the allowable range for an individual's communication competence and not related to dialect or linguistic cultural background. So a language impairment adversely affects the child's educational performance as reflected by their social interaction, behavior, emotional development, vocational impair, uh, performance, communication and or participation in classroom activities, as well as academic achievement. So when using the language um, severity rating scale, it's the same situation. So if you don't need to look at, if you're not questioning the language, then you would check no language assessment needed. Um, and for there to be an adverse effect, the team would be looking at moderate and severe in these grayed out areas. If the team determines that um, it's either mild or no uh, apparent problem, then the team would very likely determine that the, that the language does not have an adverse impact. Fluency impairment is abnormal speech production with reference to continuity, smoothness, rate, and effort which is what I'm having a problem with this morning, but it's because I've been talking for so much. <laughs> um, so this rating scale is used to determine the level of the fluency impairment. So again, we're looking at the moderate and severe columns of the, of the fluency severity rating scale. If you're not questioning fluency being an issue, then you would check off no fluency assessment needed. And again, you're looking in the moderate and severe for there to be a determination of adverse effect. 
All right, one more, and it's the voice severity rating scale. So this section is used to determine the level of voice impairment, and voice impairment is a medical condition, The di and a diagnosis from a physician is required. So again, we'd be looking at moderate and severe boxes. And here's a little bit of extra information. So again, if a child is referred for a voice impairment, there needs to be a medical referral indicated as well. And a voice impairment is the absence of abnormal production of voice characterized by deviant initiation, duration, tonal quality, pitch, loudness, and or resonance for age or speaking situation. And here is the voice severity rating scale. Again, no voice assessment needed, and the team would be looking in the moderate and severe for there to be that adverse effect. So you document in the written notice that the team completed the speech or language impairment eligibility form at the IEP team meeting, and the team determined that the child has a a uh, severe voice impairment and it has an adverse effect. So the child requires um, SDI or the child um, articulation was found to be in the mild realm and does not have an adverse effect on their ability to be educated. Okay, one more form and it is a doozy. It is the specific learning disability eligibility form. This form is used to determine the child's eligibility for special education services as a child with a specific learning disability. And just like the other forms, the very top information is all of the child's demographic information. And now we're going back to page 62 of the procedural manual. So this is part A of the form. Um, and you can see that it starts right off with question number one. Does evidence from multiple valid and reliable sources demonstrate that the child is achieving adequately for the child's age and is meeting state approved grade level standards in all areas below? Yes or no. And you can see that they very helpfully put the Muser citation there as well, just so that it's very clear that the reason that question is being asked is a Muser requirement. And you can see that there are eight different areas that would be looked at um, if the team was questioning specific learning disability. Oral expression, listening comprehension, written expression, basic reading skills, reading fluency skills, reading comprehension, mathematics calculation, and mathematics problem solving. Sources should include age-normed standardized assessments of academic achievement, statewide or district-wide assessments, curriculum-based assessments, and classroom assessment based on state standards. Where indicated, sources could include speech or language impairment, uh, pardon me, speech or language assessments. So the directions for the form is to consider whether the child is able to be successful when provided with general education curriculum. And if the question, pardon me, if the answer is yes, then you would put the basis for that information in the verification box and you get to skip right to question eight of the form. You get, do not pass go, do not collect $200 because you get to go boop right to question eight. If not, and you check no, and you check the areas where the child is not achieving adequately and is not meeting state approved grade level standards, then describe the basis for that conclusion in the verification box. And then you go to question two. So, and the verification should identify the assessments that were considered and the child scores on those assessments. So here we have question number two. If the child is not achieving adequately in all areas, is the underachievement due to the lack of learning experiences and instruction appropriate for the child's age or state approved grade level standards? So there's a couple of different things that the team should consider if they're making this when they're making this determination. The first 
is whether the child prior to or as part of the referral process was provided appropriate instruction in regular education settings and it was delivered by qualified personnel and for culturally and linguistically diverse children and children from diverse educational backgrounds, consider the extent to which the child has been exposed to culturally and linguistically appropriate education. So if the question is answered with a yes, the child doesn't qualify with a specific learning disability under MUSER. You put the information in that verification box and then you get to go to question eight now. If the question is no, then you provide that information supporting the determination in the area marked verification, and then you proceed to question number three. So this section specifically is to, to identify whether any failure to achieve adequately is the result of the lack of appropriate instruction. So... This is what this is talking about. So we want to consider whether the child has received culturally and linguistically appropriate instruction in regular education. Um, and appropriate instruction include, should include, at a minimum, instruction targeted to the child's specific area of academic weakness. So on page 64 of the specific, uh, pardon me, of the procedural manual, it goes through. Um, what appropriate instruction is. Um, it goes through talking about the child's attendance record being considered, whether the child's teacher is appropriately certified. Um, in section B, for culturally and linguistically diverse children, appropriate instruction would include instruction consistent with the knowledge and skills embedded in the assessments being used to measure academic achievement. So if it's yes, then you put the basis for that conclusion in the verification box. And if it's a no, um, and then you go on to question eight. And if it's a no, then you go right on to question three. And here we are, we've landed at question three. So this question is if the child is not achieving adequately in all areas, is the child's lack of achievement primarily the result of any of the following factors? Uh, visual, hearing, or motor disabilities. So this is where you would say, yes, it's definitely, um, and you would put that information in the verification box, or you would say no. If you say yes, you get to go to question eight. If you say no, you go on to the next factor, which is B. Sources of data for this particular question could be screenings, medical records, or observations. So we go on to section B, and it's questioning whether the, the child's um, failure to achieve adequately could be the result of an intellectual disability. And the sources of data that you would look at are cognitive scores and or adaptive behavior rating scales. So if the child does have an, in, an intellectual disability and the answer is yes, then you go on to question eight. If the answer is no, then you describe the basis for that conclusion. How did you decide that and in the verification box? And then you go on to the next factor, which is C. So this looks at emotional disturbance. And this is a tricky one. Um, this is where you consider whether the child's failure to achieve adequately is primarily the result of an emotional disturbance. Oh my gosh, my cat just came up. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Holy cow. Oh my gracious. Okay, hold on. Um, <laughs> she's like a little kid sometimes. Okay. So some, some sources of data that the team might look at in this particular section are rating scales, disciplinary records, teacher parent reports, medical records, or observations. So if you check yes, then you describe the basis of your conclusion in the verification box and you get to go to question eight. But if the answer is no, then you again put your conclusion, how the team came to that, um, that answer in the verification box and you go on to the next factor, which is D.
This question is asking about environmental, cultural, or economic disadvantage and or limited English proficiency. So this is where the team considers whether the child's failure to achieve adequately is primarily the result of an environmental, cultural, or economic disadvantage and or limited English proficiency. So you might look at WIDA scores, access scores, parent-guardian reports, or documentation of chronic life disrupt disruptions. So if the answer is yes, you put your information in the verification about how you came to that decision, move on to question eight. If the question is no, you put your verification for that no answer, and then you go on to the next question. So pages 66 and 67 of the procedural manual talk about how to go through the, um, the verification of the strengths and or the weaknesses section. When we're monitoring this section of the eligibility form, we need to see that there is something in each box, even if it's a relative strength. There shouldn't be any blank boxes in three, in, in pardon me, in section four of the um, eligibility form. So I talked earlier when we went through the SLD category about um, how lucky Maine is to have a really good root group of school psychologists. They have a group called MASP, the Maine Association of School Psychologists, and they have a resource called Clinical, the Specific Learning Disability Eligibility Form, Clinical Guidance on Implementation. And this is available on their website, and it is an invaluable resource if you are someone who fills out the SLD eligibility form. Um, and they also have done um, a couple of webinars where they've gone through and talked about the SLD form as well. And I believe that those recordings are up on their website, too. Um, and if you're someone who fills out this form with regularity, those are great resources. And here is their website. It is massbonline.net. So moving forward in the eligibility form, section number five is relevant behavior noted during the observations and its relationship to academic functioning. The child must be observed in the learning environment, including the regular classroom setting, to document the child's academic performance and behaviors in the areas of difficulty. So this is where the team would document any behaviors that were noted during the observation as it relates to academic functioning. And then the you would go on to question number six. Question number six is about educationally relevant medical findings. So this is where you would document any medical findings um, that could be related to the academic functioning. So some relevant medical conditions, those might include ADD, ADHD, seizure disorder, tick disorder, mental health diagnoses like depression or anxiety, diabetes, or traumatic brain disorder. Then you would go on to question seven. In question seven, are the evaluations utilized valid and reliable assessments and performed by qualified individuals? So this is where you are documenting evaluation validity and reliability. And then we get to magic question eight. So this is part B, the conclusions. Does a specific learning disability exist? Yes or no? So this is where the, you document the team's conclusions as to the existence of whether there's a specific learning disability or not. So if yes, and these are complicated, I don't wanna read these out loud to you guys because these question ones, if it's no, then I mean, they're a little bit complicated, all right? So just make sure that you're following the form. And if it tells you to go right to the next question that you don't miss the next question. And then question number nine is that overarching question, does the child need special education and related services in order to access their, their education? Or can their um, disability be addressed through accommodations um, and interventions in the general education curriculum? 
So here is some more information from pages 72 and 73 of the procedural manual. Important to remember that this form needs to be signed. And we know that that can be challenging sometimes, especially in the age of Zoom, right? It's very often that we're not around the table anymore, which has its great points because sometimes people are able to attend when they may not have had when they may not have been able to previously. At the same time, it does make getting documents signed more challenging. Um, and you know, some districts will literally just bring the form to the parents and have them sign it. So whatever you need to do to make that happen, and it does need to be signed. And once again, we need to see some sort of explicit statement in the written notice that the form was filled out at the IEP team meeting and the team came to the conclusion that the child qualified or the team um, decided that the child could be adequately programmed for with accommodations. Okay. So what do we want to remember with eligibility forms? We want to remember that in all of the eligibility forms, there shouldn't be any blank boxes, that the verification should be data-driven. Um, for the SLD form, we would want to see those strengths and weaknesses included, the, uh, and the eligibility form should be signed. Um, for the speech and language form, again, include data with the verifications, include all of the severity rating scales. For the determination of adverse effect on educational performance, make sure there aren't any blank boxes. Document the reason for the use of the form. Don't forget those two check boxes under the demographic information. Is this for an initial or for a reeval? NA means not available. And don't forget the statement in the written notice for any eligibility forms that you're filling out. Here are, um, here's an example, pardon me, here is a snip of the table of contents again to show you specifically where in the procedural manual the information about each of these forms is found. And if you just take a look, like the determination of adverse effect form, there are six pages in the procedural manual that go through every single section of that form. <clears throat> For the specific learning disability, there are 12 pages. So the procedural manual is extremely detailed. So some commonly asked questions that we get specific to eligibility forms are, do all the questions on the adverse effect form need to be answered? Yes, they do. There should not be any blanks. Do the eligibility forms need to be completed during the IEPT meeting? Yes, they do. And that statement should be in the written notice. The SLD form should be signed by all team members. And if there's a change in eligibility, it might be necessary to complete multiple eligibility forms. Here is our 22-23 office hours. I can't even believe we're already into March. Today, Carly is debuting a wonderful PowerPoint about written notices. So hopefully, well, I, this is a recording anyway, so never mind. Hopefully we saw you then. Um, here are our resources, links for all of our recordings, um, special ed laws and regulations, our PD calendar. Um, we love feedback. We really want your feedback. So if you are watching this recording, go ahead and either um, click this link or use your smartphone to do the QR code and it's going to ask you a few questions about what you thought of the PD. Make sure to choose the um, eligibility forms. Am I missing anything, Carly? Um, I just want to, because we're doing these like new modules, so it's a little bit different. So you'll select your training and just say you watched a module and then you'll be directed to which module you watched. So you'll want to Click, uh, check off the eligibility forms module, and then you'll get all of the information that goes with this specific recording. Perfect. Thank you. So okay. you will get a contact hour certificate. You will get user. You'll get the procedural manual. You'll get our IEP quick reference document. The office hours schedule. Office hours schedule. And a copy of this 
um, PowerPoint PDF as an attachment. Yep. There we go. And a copy of this PDF. I mean, it's like hitting the lottery. All you got to <laughs> do is do the QR code and boom, you're a winner. So there you go. And here, once again, is our contact information. We love to hear from you guys. We love it. If you are questioning something, reach out to us, um, you know, before it becomes something that has to be corrected in a larger area. Uh, we're happy to help you out. Um, that's what we're here for. So thank you very much for watching this recording. Thank you so much, Carly, for sitting through it with me. I appreciate that. And we hope to see you all soon. All right. Bye. Bye.